is plentiful. We are streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning and go to two or three people and say, I am so, so glad that you are here today. Glad you're here, guys. Miss you when you're not here.
To shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. I won't fear what tomorrow brings. With each morning, I'll rise and sing. My God's love will. Through you are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you. Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. 
to show Safe to show Fire before us You're the brightest You will lead us Through the storm Fire before us You're the brightest You will lead us Through the storm Hey! Welcome to the Connect service. And those online, we welcome you as well. And this is your Connect band. Give them a hand. <laughs> Tonight, we are singing mostly in tune. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> mostly. Mostly. You know, at this time, we're going to take a little step down. When you come into church, you need to find a way to worship. And we get in front of the throne of God and, and pray for that. So let's do that right now. In the Thank you for the privilege of being in your house today. Father, there are those that are counting on us in our family, our church family, to pray for them. And God, this morning we want to lift up our brothers and sisters to the Lord. And that God, you would intercede in their lives or whatever they be uh, they are dealing with at this time, whether they're feeling bad or 
whether they're hurting, whether they're grieving, God, that you would just reach down and touch them right now. Those that are in this room, those that are watching online, Father, that you would just minister to them. We thank you and we praise you. Father, we pray for those that protect us. Father, those that keep us safe, and those that keep us well. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you just give them strength. We give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise. We pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Say hi to, again to someone before you're seated this morning. And I'm glad to have you here today. Here's what's happening at Kimberlin City United Methodist Church. Special music today from live on the video. How's that? <laughs> live on your video screen, Trisha Weidert. That precious blood that flowed from Calvary. 
the sinner holy. Come wash me clean till every part of me is yours and yours only. It's been so long since I felt Jesus. Just once again, I long to a glimpse of Calvary, remembering nights down on my knees in prayer. I said, Lord, here I am, please use me. A fool was I to ever leave you. Please take me now, oh God. So we still are doing, on occasion, uh, some of those who aren't back to attending in person yet participate by uh, sharing a video uh, for special music. And uh, Tricia shared that for this week with us. I'm looking forward to when everybody feels comfortable with getting out and being in-person worship. Jim Canyo is passing out your uh, communion bread and wine in one convenient little package today. And... Uh, he is, and he does it. He does it with class too. And while he's doing that, I'm just going to charge right into this. This is the third part of the series that is titled "Tell Me Something Good." And my thinking on this was simply: uh, there's always good news in the Gospels, and uh, the world around us is full of bad news. As a matter of fact, you turn on anything called the news and it's going to be a downer for you really fast. As a matter of fact, I don't think it could be more successful if they set and planned how can we discourage people by crafting uh, stories and items for people to be down about. Uh, and yet they've got their job to do. However, if you're starting to feel like that's a little depressing and you're getting a bleak outlook on life, just step away from that for a moment and open up any one of the four Gospels and suddenly you will discover there's a much larger picture than what is portrayed in the daily news cycle. You'll discover there's an eternal God who loves you with an everlasting love. And you'll discover that this same God has invested in you with hopes and expectations and has a plan and is all about a relationship with you. And you discover this kind of love is unequaled and that what he is doing is preparing an eternal kind of experience for you that is filled with nothing but good. I don't know how you can find anything to compare with that good news. 
There certainly isn't any earthly event that will even come close to that, regardless of how momentous it seems at, at the time of the event or the occasion. So we go to the four Gospels. If you remember, the first week we talked about Matthew's Gospel. And if you remember, Matthew portrayed Jesus as the king. And the symbol we saw for that was the symbol of the lion. The second week we went to Mark's Gospel. And Mark portrayed Jesus as the servant. Remember the key verse was, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give himself or his life a ransom for many. And so the uh, uh, symbol for that was the ox, the beast that serves. And then, of course, uh, today we go into Luke's gospel and Luke emphasizes Jesus as a, a man. But um, lest you forget, we will go back to the, uh, to the scriptures that I had shared before. Uh, the next slide, you'll see the scripture from Ezekiel. God had given Ezekiel a vision that was communicating and revealing himself to Ezekiel so that he could share that with others. And as we talked about this a little bit last week, Sometimes the things that God reveals are beyond what our current vocabulary and technology allow us to understand properly. So he used the language that he had at the time uh, and the vocabulary he had to explain this. He said, as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle." I'd asked the question last Sunday, if you could somehow put your, yourself in the mindset of living in the first century, that goes back like 2,000 years, think of the technology and the means of communication that were available and the extent of vocabulary that you might have in the first century, and let's just put you out in the desert and in the middle of the night, and while you're there, something no one in your world has ever seen before happens. An 18-wheeler comes, comes right by you at about 70 miles per hour with all the lights on, and he hits the air horn as he comes by you. Now, what words would you use to describe what you just saw if that happened to you in the first century? Well, probably, definitely monster is going to be in there. Was that a word in the first century? You would, it would be now, right? I don't know, country Mike. I don't know, man. You were funnier when you were piratey, Mike. <laughs> but you, you get the idea. Ezekiel used his own understanding to describe this magnificent thing he'd seen. Later, a few hundred years later, John, who was the author of the Gospel of John, uh, was writing the book of Revelation. He wrote sometime after the book of John, close to around 90 AD, is about the earliest we can place that. He was a much older man. And in writing the book of Revelation, uh, God had revealed to him a glimpse or a vision of the throne room in heaven. And he described what he was seeing there as beasts, some kind of created beings. And he said it like this, the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf. And some translations actually use ox there. Uh, and the third beast had a face of a man and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. The same four images. And we find each of the four gospels are parallel to one of these. Today, the face of the man as uh, we see Luke portraying Jesus as the son of man. And in no way do we see that more evident than in his vulnerability when he was uh, voluntarily laying aside his uh, powers of deity, his God powers, and allowed himself to be taken, arrested, going to the fake trials that he went through, and of course, uh, beaten, uh, mocked, and then, of course, carrying the cross, being crucified, placed in the tomb. And then, of course, we see the resurrection. All, in all of that, we see Jesus Christ, the human. 
In all of that, we see him laying aside all the powers of deity that were rightfully his in order to be 100% man and to suffer in all manner just as us. And so I sort of zeroed in on that. If you're wondering if I left out one of the Gospels, next week it would be the Gospel of John, and there's one with the four symbols left. Did anybody keep up with what it is? The eagle, which shows the deity of Christ, who shows that he, he is God. But today, I'd like us to get a glimpse into uh, the manhood of Jesus Christ, his, uh, his human experience. Um, and it's a little bit odd that I'm taking the resurrection passage to, to deal with that. And it's simply this. What we had there was, in fact, Jesus is a 100% human who was 100% dead. We talked about this on Easter. Jesus was as dead as a man can get. He didn't just have his heart go idle for a couple of beats. He didn't slip into a coma that he later came out of. He wasn't just deeply unconscious or anything like that. Uh, the Ozark terminology for it is he was dead as a doornail. That's, I don't know what a doornail is or why everybody thinks they're dead, but I'm pretty sure they're dead. Uh, but dead is a doornail. He was as dead as dead can be. And then he was resurrected from the grave. And so I want to go to the passage of scripture and just get a little bit into the experience of what happened with the people who came to see him there. And then uh, I'll admit, I'm going to springboard out of that into a few truths that apply to us rather than go to a deeper study into the passage of scripture, if you guys will indulge me in that. Okay. Luke chapter 24, starting with verse one. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he is risen. Now, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. Now, notice this. It makes a, a sort of a big point of, don't you remember what he told you was going to happen? And if you look back, he told them, we're going to Jerusalem and all the things that are prophesied about the Son of Man are going to take place. He told them that he would be delivered over to the hands of the sinners. He said the Gentiles, I believe, and that he would be crucified and he would arise from the grave. Now notice this, had they believed him, had they understood and got that, when Jesus was being crucified, they wouldn't have ran away to hide for fear it was going to happen to them. They would have said, look at this, right on schedule. We are right on track exactly the way he said. Is that what they were doing? No. When he was buried and put in the tomb and they were all, remember, off hiding, keeping quiet. Had they really believed they would have been saying, oh man, this is going to be so amazing. Wait till Sunday morning. We find out he's gone out of the tomb. This is going to be, this is, oh, this is incredible. Can't wait to see it. That's not how they were acting though, is it? And the women go with prepared spices to the tomb. And what, were the, what was the point of the spices again? What were they going to use that for? They're going to keep the body from stinking for a while. That was the idea. But the funny thing was, they were gone there to look for somebody who was what? Living or dead? dead. Totally dead. Exactly. And that's a good place to look for somebody dead. Right? And, but the angel said to them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And they're like, oh, I thought I was looking for somebody dead. Because that is the right place to look. If you were looking for somebody alive, you wouldn't go down to the graveyard and find a tomb to go poking around in, right? I wouldn't. 
But that's what they did because they expected him to be dead. It wasn't so. They had totally missed it. But just like them, here's, here's the first thought, the first truth I want us to kind of wrestle with. And that is we often seek life among the dead. And the, the way I want to portray this is, is sort of this way. Uh, there are so many things that we want and need out of life. And in almost every case, Jesus Christ is the pure and true source of exactly what we need or desire. Remember how Jesus himself said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this other stuff will be added or given to you. But we go for the other stuff thinking that's the way we're going to find the things that really matter. But we totally, totally, totally miss out on that because we're looking in the wrong place. And it's not because we hate God. It's not because we're stupid. It's just because it's human nature to do that, isn't it? We look for the thing that we desire or that we think is going to be important in our lives. Quick story here. Several years back, I met a guy named Carl. And he told me about God working a miracle in his life. You know, eventually this whole thing comes full circle back to God is going to do miracles for you and for me when we truly believe. Uh, but Carl told the story about how God had worked a miracle in his life. Here's what happened. He and his wife were completely ready for a divorce. I mean, they had tried a lot of things. But the story, the backstory was both of them had had affairs. And in so doing, they had repeatedly ruined or destroyed their trust in one another to the point where they had no place to even start with that. Now, Carl did want to reconcile and save his marriage, but every attempt he had would fail. And he and his wife just kept creating more and more distance between each other. Um, she would drive him away with her anger. He would drive her away with his jealousy. And then occasionally they would switch roles and do it the other way around. And trust just kept spiraling downward and there was really nothing left. Uh, during this time, Carl got an email that he thought might be a solution when he saw it because the subject line was revitalize your marriage. Yep, he clicked on it only to discover it was a spam ad for Viagra. And he says, the last thing in the world I need right now is to be buying something like this. This is ridiculous. He and his wife were seeing marriage counselors, uh, both separately and together. They were doing this. And the point came where his counselor told him in private, look, Carl, it's time for you to go ahead and start making a plan for beginning a new chapter in your life where you function as a single dad. That's where they were with all of this. Now, about that time, his wife had gone ahead and scheduled an appointment with an attorney on Monday morning. Um, but as kind of a last-ditch effort, she talked Carl into going together to a new church her parents were going to. And, of course, desperate for anything, he, he agreed. And he got there and found out that they had this little banner up that had the title of today's sermon on it, and it said, How to Revitalize Your Marriage. And he's like, I already saw this before, man. I know where this goes. <laughs> Nevertheless, they sat through the service, and it wasn't that. It was something much better. It was totally, totally great. And they were both deeply moved during that time. They had this God experience, both of them. When the invitation was given at the end, they both went forward, gave their lives to Jesus, and had still planned to go to the attorney the next morning. But they started talking, and they said, you know, I don't think I'm ready to give this away. We do have a love for each other, and I think we can recover from this. And they gradually began, and their marriage was also saved. But for all these months, they had been looking all the wrong places. They wanted to save their marriage, but they hadn't gone to God with it. They hadn't turned to Jesus Christ about it, who really did have the solution for them. You know, I think in so many areas of life, we look for what we want rather than the source of what we want or desire. Um, you get a glimpse of daytime TV and you might get the idea that an affair will make you feel more loved. 
Or you might get the idea that a divorce could take away the isolation or hurt that you've felt. Or that accumulating more possessions will increase your sense of self-worth. But we all know none of it works that way, does it? But all of those things, to feel more loved, to be healed from isolation and hurt, to have a greater sense of value and worth, all comes, once again, from Jesus Christ, the one who gives everything to us. In other words, don't look for life among the dead, but the things that are life-giving will come from the very source of life itself, Jesus Christ. The second truth I think we pull out of this is we sometimes don't take God's promises seriously. And this is a good one. Um, we read the promises of God and we think, well, you know, that's kind of nice for people a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years ago. We live in a different world today, right? Tony Campolo told a, a friend of his who was a professor at a very prestigious university, of course, and he told him the story about a healing that he had witnessed firsthand, a uh, miraculous healing. His friend, the professor, replied and said, you know what, uh, I've got a problem with you claiming that experience. And he said, well, why? He said, well, that kind of thing just doesn't fit in my theology. He thought about it for a minute and said, well, did, did it ever occur to you that maybe God is bigger than your theology? That, yeah, every single time God turns out to be bigger than the framework that we have around our beliefs in God. Tony Campolo also said, as you see on the screen right now, I've always been skeptical of those television healers who are bald. If I had that gift, what gift? The gift of healing, that's the first thing I would fix. Yeah, how can you believe somebody who claims to heal when they can't heal their bald head, right? <laughs> I guess I'd never go into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you want some credibility, right? <laughs> you need a little bit of street cred there, right? But here's it. The idea of God working a miracle in your life isn't just nonsense. It's a practicality and it is a promise and we never know how God might choose to solve the issues we face in life. Here's, here's a good question for you. Think for just a moment about what you would view as the greatest challenge or greatest problem that you face in your life right now. The greatest need, challenge, problem, however you want to phrase that. You know, that uncomfortable thing that you just don't have a solution for. But now think for a moment about if you had the perfect solution for that just arrive. And I mean the absolute best possible outcome in that situation. Just unimaginably good. Perfect solution. Your greatest problem. What would that look like? How would that look? Think about that for a second. Now, the big question is, are you asking God to do that with your big problem? And why not? Look, I can't by any means guarantee, yeah, if you just tell God that's what you want, it's going to come delivered to your front door tomorrow morning. I can't guarantee that. But I have seen God respond and answer amazingly in prayer. How do we know if we don't ask God? How do we know if we don't give prayer a chance? And sometimes it takes some patience. I'll guarantee you when Joseph was put in the prison in Egypt, he prayed every day for God to get him out of there. Can you imagine the first week he prayed every day and nothing happened? Another week passes. Every day he's praying, nothing happens. Wait, how long was he there? Anybody remember? 12 years. And every day, Maybe today will be the day. He didn't give up hope and kept praying. And sure enough, God didn't just deliver him out of that, but the most amazingly perfect possible outcome he could have ever imagined came out of that. Do you think God won't do something like that in your life? God can't. You're not going to find out unless you ask God. And so the third thought today is simply try to look through the eyes of faith. So much of the time when God does something amazing, we look for another explanation, don't we? Uh, like the guy 
who was working on a steep roof. And Robin, I know you got somebody working on your roof today. I hope this isn't, isn't what happens with them. Uh, on a steep roof, he slipped, started sliding and tumbling down the roof. And he just, just ref, in a reflex, he cried, oh God, please save me. And just at that second, the cuff of his pants snagged on a nail that was sticking up and stopped his fall before he got to the edge of the roof. He looked down and saw that and said, never mind, God, I'm okay. <laughs> now, two different ways of looking at this. God answered his prayer with a miracle or, no, I didn't really need God anyway because there was this nail there that stopped me instead. We look for the other explanation. Which way do you choose to look at it? This perspective, this outlook is what changes everything, isn't it? Because if you go with the other explanation, there's no need to be grateful and thank God for it because God had nothing to do with it. But on the other hand, if you think, wow, what a miracle. There was this nail that somehow God knew I would need to save me someday that somebody left sticking up out there years ago and today it saved me. Thank you, God. Totally different outlook, isn't it? Try to look through the eyes of faith. And here's one of my favorite stories on this, true story. Uh, the one about the roof and, and everything was just a joke. This one's a real story. And like one guy said, this is not preaching, it's the truth. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, I love that. So th here's a woman, seriously ill for quite a while. Uh, she has a rare degenerative bone disease. And for the last three months, she's been confined to a rented hospital bed in her own living room. If you can just imagine that kind of situation. You've probably seen somebody in a situation like that. Uh, I certainly have. She was too weak and in way too much pain to get out and do anything. Doctors had told her she was in the terminal stages of the degenerative disease. And we've probably all seen people in that kind of setting. She knew she was dying and had come to a place where she was accepting that. But she had said, I want to experience church one more time before I die. I just want to go to church one time before life is over. Now, she did not go out to a Pentecostal miracle rally. She did not go to a big... Uh, charismatic healing service with the name, uh, you know, healing power kind of person there, anything like that. As a matter of fact, she attended a United Methodist Church. By her own admission, she did not go there expecting any kind of healing or a miracle. No one there laid hands on her or prayed for her. But somehow during that service, she was miraculously healed. She just suddenly felt better. They had carried her in and set her in a pew. The service was over. She got up and walked out in her own power. Uh, that week, she went to her doctor to confirm what she thought she had experienced. The doctor said, I don't find any evidence of that disease in your body. As far as I'm concerned, you're a perfectly healthy person today. Now, you would think that's the most amazing part of the story. It's not. Here, here's the amazing part of the story. The people at church heard about this and started looking for other explanations. And the best one that came up and dominated the whole conversation later on was, well, probably getting out of the house into the fresh air caused her to get well again. Now, think with me for just a minute. Let's, let's just process this, okay? Okay. You've got a degenerative bone disease. You're in the terminal stages of that. And let's just say you go to a doctor and the doctor says, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about this. Just get out and get a little fresh air and it'll heal you right up. <laughs> what would you think of a doctor who said that? You would not recommend this doctor to your friends and family. You would never go back yourself. And yet the people at church are much more willing to believe that than that God healed her. That's the amazing part of the story. We 
got to look through the eyes of faith instead of always looking for some other explanation. Yeah, fresh air heals terminal disease rather than God. Leave it up to the people at church. They'll figure it out for you, right? Um, it's not to pick on church people, but it's just that we all identify with that, don't we? Because we're afraid sometimes to really put it out there and say, God healed me. God answered my prayer. For fear of something else is going to happen and we'll find out it wasn't really true and we look really stupid. Why not give prayer a chance? Why not give God a chance? And when we have a chance to, to give God credit for anything, let's just do that because that's looking through the eyes of faith. Better than the alternative, isn't it? And you know, the key verse in Luke's gospel kind of takes us back, back on track because this was kind of a springboard as I early on admitted. The key verse in the, Luke's gospel is simply this, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. We get his purpose statement there again. Notice how through Jesus as king, Jesus as servant, and Jesus as man. In each case, we get a full purpose statement, a key verse out of that gospel. But he makes it clear that that was what he was all about. And it goes back to God's heart of love for all of us and what Jesus was doing there. Again, the miracle that Jesus went to the cross that he died, that he went to the tomb, and that he arose from the grave tells us that God has miracles for us and that Jesus Christ is deeply invested in you and me because we were the lost. And he is going to save us, not just barely, but we're told he saves us to the uttermost. In other words, far beyond any of our hopes and dreams and expectations, God is delivering us. You better believe God's got some miracles for you. Um, my wrap up is this and the takeaway, God still works miracles. God wants to work a miracle for you. Just start believing it. Start praying and asking for it. Seek life. The things that are all about life from the source of life, Jesus Christ. Believe God's promises that come in the scripture there for you and try to see life through the eyes of faith, always recognizing God's hand at work. Why? Because God is always at work. Let me ask you to pray with me. Okay. God, let our eyes of faith be opened and let us see you deeply at work in all that goes on around us. And let us experience that great miracle, the solution to each person here in their deepest challenge that is just overwhelmingly perfect. In Jesus' name, amen. As we uh, are starting to close out this service, as I mentioned earlier, we each have our uh, communion packet. Uh, kind of hold on to that. If you get ahead of us, it's okay. It won't hurt anything. Uh, we'll try to do it together, though. And um, we're going to do just a little preparation of preparing our hearts for communion today. And I'll ask you to just follow along with me, I believe. Um, the Lord be with you and also lift up your hearts let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth you formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. 
By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And when the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now you notice you've got two layers you can peel back. If you peel that first one back, you'll have the bread there. That bread is our steadfast reminder that demonstrates to us Jesus indeed gave his body when he died on the cross. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we'll now take the cup, the reminder that Jesus indeed poured out his blood for us when he went to the cross for the forgiveness of sins. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Together now, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your spirit. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever, and everyone said, amen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And why don't you stand to your feet this Put your hands together. Oh, your ways are good. Oh, your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Higher than my side, higher than my life. I will trust in you alone.
In this life I lose, I will fall. 